aka Dynamite, and tonight we're going to be talking about the entire story of Vanguard Zombies from start to finish, just who all the characters are, and the implications for Black Ops 2024 Zombies. Definitely stay tuned, but before we jump into that, be sure to hit that subscribe button down below, drop a like, and make sure you have notifications on to stay up to date with everything going on in Cold War Year 2, Warzone, Modern Warfare 2, Vanguard, and any other future Call of Duty as well. But considering this is a Zombies-focused video, be sure to check out the Juggernaut beanies available over on eBay. They were put together by a legendary zombies community member known as perk lemonade and he figured you know what we're about to go on a two-year hiatus with zombies as a mode why not give back to the zombies community and put something together for those out there that also want to get ready for winter so be sure to check out all these juggernaut beanies linked down below while they're still available but let's take a trip through the ether shall we now, the first part of Cold War's chapter of this story was to introduce us to Project End Station, originally designed as a research outpost for the German nuclear program in World War II. End Station accidentally tore a hole in the dimensional veil between the world and the Dark Aether in March of 1944. Those following Cold War's storyline will know what else End Station researched following this, but Vanguard details what happened elsewhere as a direct consequence of this event. At this exact moment, five ancient artifacts in the possession of the SS Battalion, Die Warheit, did activate, and this then allowed their leader, the Wolfram von List, the one and only, to bond with an entity trapped within one such artifact. But who are the Die Warheit? Die Warheit are a fictional SS battalion in Vanguard Zombies based on the real-life expeditions of the SS and Anerb. Die Warheit, in order to gain a strategic advantage over the Allies, and enabled through Reichsfurs Heinrich Himmler's obsession with the occult, attempted to find more unconventional and exotic sources of power that appear only in myths and legends, such as Thor's Hammer, the Holy Grail, Shangri-La, and even Atlantis. In 1939, Von List arrived unannounced at Leipzig University in Germany. He met with a professor of demonology known as Gabriel Kraft. Von List told Kraft he had to tender his resignation immediately, pack a suitcase, and go with Von List as an advisor on an overseas Die Warheit expedition. After Kraft left at the ludicrous suggestion, Von List showed he was deadly serious, took his gun from his belt, and killed Kraft's assistant. After this, Von List had Kraft thrown in an SS prison with a dozen and other experts who had similarly been recruited from universities and museums. The officer arrived and informed the explorers, historians, and archaeologists that they will find the artifacts they were searching for, despite the fact they all knew these were objects of legend, not fact. Kraft lashed out, saying he knew what the Nazis were doing as he'd seen his friends dragged off to camps. Von List simply smiled, and instead of shooting Kraft, he sent his men to the professor's home and had his spouse taken to an interrogation cell. Now, should Kraft refuse, it wasn't he who'd suffer the consequences, but the love of his life. Knowing he had to now follow the orders of Von List, Kraft made a silent promise that he would somehow, someday, destroy Die Warheit from within. In the coming years, Die Warheit would begin operations in Egypt, Greece, Iceland, Mexico, and even Japan. Many other as well, but they uncovered strange carvings that didn't really fit with established archaeology in the regions and later, even stranger artifacts. These artifacts, though dormant at the time, were the very same ones that would later awaken when End Station made its initial breach. Once this happened, Valus was able to make his pact with Cortifex, he would gain the Elder God's power to raise the dead, and in return, Valus would act as Cortifex's physical body. Why this is the case, though, is a question that we'll answer later. Now, with Duran Fung, in mid-1944, likely around May, Valus returned turned to the site of Germany's greatest defeat, Stalingrad, and used his abilities that he had been lent by Cortifix, of course, to create a containment spell, sealing off the part of the city they were currently in. With this done, he began raising the millions of corpses that littered the Eastern Front, turning them into undead revenants. Knowing the barrier would soon rise, and Von List would likely have little use for craft, the professor did something drastic. Using an artifact that he had recovered called the Tome of Rituals, Kraft formed a rune barrier around his office, preventing Die Warheit from being able to to get to him, but also leaving him with, currently, no way to escape the room. With his safety assured, at least for now, he radioed for help, with a team of special forces arriving just as the barrier spell formed. However, luckily for these soldiers, it wouldn't only be Kraft guiding them, likely left out for them by Kraft. The team each bonded with one of the four artifacts recovered by Die Warheit, and these were Nordicus, the Conqueror, the Frostblast, Belakar, the Warlock, Aether Shroud, Invictor, the Destroyer, which is Ring of Fire, and Seraxis, the Shadow, the Energy Mine. In these war-torn ruins and swarmed by revenants, the Special Forces team had to fend off the undead while teleporting to areas similarly investigated by Die Warheit to strike back against Cortifix and Von List. This included Merville, which shortly after Duran Fung would see the D-Day landings, Hotel Royal in Paris, and a Japanese
Japanese Army Camp Naladai Warheit Excavation Site. When the team needs to rest, they're able to utilize the Rune Gate, placed at the center of the city, aided by their unconventional allies, they open a portal which essentially acts as a bunker until they wish to fight once more. Now we do have some immediate consequences to this story. The most obvious new addition is the word Revenant, and this is seemingly one of our first insights into the culture of the Dark Aether, as they use this word instead of zombie or undead. Other interesting notes is that the containment spell we see is, in all likelihood, a phase wall. In Cold War, people like Strauss and Gray examine these phenomena with a scientific method, but to Kraft and Von List, these seem to be simply rune magic. Now that in itself is another key point, rune magic. In the Dark Aether, beings who are natives of this world are able to use these runes in order to channel their power and manifest it in the real world. What's interesting though is that this isn't a new concept in zombies, as we see this in both Shadows of Evil, with the Keepers and Apothecan languages that allow wooden crates to become almost indestructible, and in Blood of the Dead's boss fight, where the Warden uses Apothecan runes of harming to literally damage the player, this would imply that rune magic is among one of the oldest arts in the Dark Aether, and whilst none of those beings from the Aether storyline exist anymore, their legacy, in a way, still lives on. One of the most interesting finds, though, is that of environmental storytelling within these maps, specifically Shinonuma. In the map, we can at first spot a Japanese painting of Seraxis appearing to samurai, but if we look a little closer, we can spot something else that really doesn't belong, a stone with an old Norse inscription with a snake-like carving. This find really begins to sow the suggestion that these Dark Aether entities have been meddling in human affair for a long time, but then that begs the question, how could they do this before End Station? This is a question that we'll dive into later. First though, we need to look at the lore we get from the entities individually through their radios. Now with Cortifex the Deathless, Cortifex was at one time the Lord of the Dark Aether having launched a brutal conflict known as the Nether Wars against his adversaries and ruling with an iron fist. However, Cortifex's reign would not last as the most powerful elder gods of the Dark Aether, including his own general, allied against him. At one time, Cortifex was revered in ancient Egypt and in personal contact with the pharaoh of Egypt, who at one point was the cruelest human he had ever encountered. However, this spot will later be taken by Wolfram von List, who he says has the blackest heart of any human he has ever encountered. Now we then have Seraxis the Shadow. According to Seraxis, she's always had an interest in humans since we, and I quote, raised our cities. Though she sees us as interesting playthings, not a race of equals, she claims that her playthings only meet bad ends when they stop doing what she says and attempt to employ concepts like morality, which she sees as rather silly. She then goes on to claim that the ones who played well with her became emperors, conquerors, and even peacemakers in our world. This into a particular still keeps her character mysterious, but it reinforces that point from earlier that these entities have been in contact with humanity for who knows how long. But we then have Invictor the Destroyer. Invictor, a veteran of a thousand battles in the wasteland of the Dark Aether is a true soldier through and through, even claiming it was he who first taught mankind how to make war. In his runestone, he says he can't understand what makes this special forces team so special when he's seen the best warriors fall in battle and half-starved mothers kill soldiers twice their size to protect their children. He says that if we want his respect, we have to prove our abilities to him. From Invictor's lore, an important thing we have to take in is the sheer number of battles he fought in. The Dark Aether is an incredibly violent place and he is one of its best soldiers. Now we then have Belakar the Warlock. Belakar states that she has also been keeping her eye on humanity for an exceedingly long time, but she shows admiration for us. She is Belakar the Warlock, and she was the one chronicler of the Nether Wars, something we will be hearing more about soon, where she wrote her histories right there on the battlefield. She says that unlike battles in the Dark Aether, which are determined by raw factors, speed, deception, firepower, magic, or the weather, human battles are, in her eyes, incredibly poetic, and she asks us to keep her informed with what we're thinking at all times, and not to keep secrets from her, as if we keep secrets Secrets, she can't help us. She goes on to talk about the Mayans, who allegedly understood her best. She allegedly tried to teach them the rune magic, but it overwhelmed them. Later, she was forced to watch a civilization collapse. Since then, she has always looked for the signs that suggest the impending doom of a civilization, and says that World War II is the most significant one that she has seen throughout mankind's entire history. We then have Nordicus the Conqueror. Nordicus, once General Nordicus, Supreme Commander of the Night Legions, states at his height, his enemies would have thrown down their weapons and begged for mercy at the mere mention of his name, and yet now, he is trapped within an artifact and bound to see what he sees as a pathetic bag of blood whose lifespan is as brief as it is meaningless. However, he resolves to get out of this most unfortunate situation and promises to hone our skills and make us unstoppable. He then says, and I quote, I save your world, you get me back to mine.
mine. He goes on to elaborate about the nature of the Dark Aether and how they have been in constant state of war since time began. Because Nordicus was the greatest general, Cortifix put him in command of his armies, then they launched the Nether Wars on all of Cortifix's rivals, but due to the Lord's cruel nature, Nordicus felt no loyalty, and when he saw their enemies unifying one by one into a single army that they would not be able to beat, Nordicus knew that he had to join the winning side. He tells us that when they joined together and toppled Cortifix's throne, he swore revenge, and he is now using Von List as a means to this. But these are like genies in bottles, so it's time we discuss the elephant in the room here. If these entities are from the Dark Aether, why are they acting as if they're trapped on Earth? The reason for this is because, in actual fact, these entities haven't been in the Dark Aether for some time, and have been trapped within the artifacts, only now reawakening as the connection to the Dark Aether, as it's re-established with End Station. This is also why the transmit objective is Belakar sending a message to the Dark Aether to call for help, because currently, they are on Earth and have no other way to contact those who are there. The artifacts themselves were originally created in the Dark Aether, specifically to appeal to humans. However, as Kraft points out, the Smiths in the Dark Aether had virtually no experience with human culture, and so the artifacts don't really fit into any established human tradition. In these ancient times, where humans seemingly communed with these Dark Aether entities as if they were gods or spirits, it seems like they used these artifacts, although back then, the entities were still within the Dark Aether and just linked to the items, not literally within them like they are now. This raises an interesting question though, if these beings used to be in contact with humans, but End Station allowed the artifacts to reactivate, why was Earth's connection to the Dark Aether lost in the first place? The current answer is that we don't actually know, however the current prevailing theory from the likes of Kaljitsu here is that, just like how Zykov had to go into the Dark Aether to shut the End Station portal down, but this severed his connection to Earth, the other Elder Gods did the opposite though, sacrificing themselves to stop Cortifix and altogether bringing him out of the Dark Aether and closing whatever gateway existed from the side of the Earth. This may have even caused them to recede into the artifacts as it was their presence in this dimension that was until End Station allowed their connection to be re-established. This will then explain their motivations though. They all want to go home, but in order to do so, have to use humans to transport them in their artifacts until eventually they can be sent back. Again, this is a partial theory, but what is fact is that these entities are within the artifacts and want to return to the Dark Aether. Now in regards to the main quest and future experiences, I'll of course make a follow-up video to this one talking about whatever story implications are included in that quest. The next major addition of Duran Fung, aside from new objectives and features which will be coming in Season 1 without a doubt, is of course a main quest, which at this point has been implied to be Season 1 Reloaded-ish. So far what we know is that it will tie in with the arrival of an unexpected ally. That's an exact quote from Treyarch. Now we can't say for certain who this is referring to and could even be a fan favorite character like Reznov, as some people have speculated, but given the fact that the transmit objective is all about trying to send a message to an ally in the Dark Aether, the most likely guess at the moment right now is Zilat Sparagamos who we first heard from in Forsaken, the creator of the Chrysalax and devoted follower of the Old Ones. From a purely gameplay perspective, this would make a lot of sense as it would allow a lore reason for a new Wonder Weapon from the Dark Aether to be introduced. The same person who made the Chrysalax could make our Wonder Weapon for Duran Fung, who would have guessed? For content after that though, Intel may have an answer. When talking to Cortifix, Von Liss expresses his worries as he had to accelerate Dai Warheit's timetable. The reason for this is because the Allies were beginning to assemble their D-Day invasion force, and by the time they are ready, Von Liss wants to ensure he has his undead army ready as well. It is therefore possible that a future zombies experience we get in this plotline involves D-Day, though this will probably become clearer with the Season 1 intel we end up getting. Now also in Duran Fong, there are absolutely tons of quotes from the Dark Aether entities about things such as perks, the mystery box, pack-a-punch, and they also give additional lore about these items. The perks first off, which follow a non-traditional system in this game, are confirmed to be demon blood, or to be more realistic, the blood of entities within the Dark Aether. It is implied that when consumed, this blood becomes a part of the Special Forces team. If we think about this from a scientific perspective that we get in Cold War, this is no different than to developing powers from Ethereum exposure on a large scale, like we see with Sam, but on a smaller scale here, and this exact thing happens when we drink perks over in Black Ops Cold War. The mystery box is very interesting though, as the entities comment about being unsure as to how exactly it works, but knowing full well its usefulness. Given that it's the same box as the original mystery box, and this is even true in Cold War, the implication is that it is still the same mystery box that was with us all the way back in Nocturne Toten and has been sitting in the Dark Aether as an ancient relic. Yes, you heard that right, all the way from the original Aether storyline in Call of Duty World at War. The pack of much is similarly interesting though, since during most of the Cold War, we assumed that Zykov had found the broken machine and then installed all the new parts we see. Later though, we found out he acquired the machine from the domain of an old one who hoarded technology, and with a twist in Forsaken, it became obvious that it was probably less that he found it and more that he killed the old one who used to own it. 
Given it is in Vanguard, it seems likely, therefore, that the large piece now in the middle of the machine was installed by this old one as a repair. A point worth noting, however, is that people have been incorrectly claiming that the Pack-a-Punch model is the same one used in Cold War. At first glance, that seems true, but when you take a closer look, it becomes obvious this is not the case at all, and that maybe Zykov really did repair part of the machine after all. If we look at the yellow screen to the right of the centerpiece of Pack-a-Punch, we see in Cold War that it plays a little animation of different weapons, but in Vanguard, this screen is smashed and doesn't work. This also means this might be the piece responsible for dispensing AATs on guns. We obviously don't have those here in Vanguard Zombies, they're in the form of Covenants. Now what's also suspicious is that the entities are unaware of who made it, the pack much machine that is, but if Victor says whoever it was, they must have been a genius at the forge. Maybe a reference to Jeb Brown from the original Ether story, the machine's original creator of course. And Victor specifically also gives us two pieces of information which are quite shocking given everything we know so far. The first is that he says he has seen such crucibles like this in the Dark Ether, and that they use quote-unquote powerful magic, implying that in this new world without 115, the method of upgrading weapons uses some form of dark ether rune magic, and that other beings in the dark ether have been doing it for quite some time. The most interesting quote he says, however, is that, and I quote, Hephaestus himself would kneel at this forge. This quote is insane because for those who don't know, Hephaestus is the Greek god of smithing. This implies that either Hephaestus is a dark ether entity who Invictor knew personally, and who inspired the mythological figure, or that Invictor is incredibly familiar with the ancient Greek religion. Don't worry if you guys missed out on some intel in Vanguard Zombies, here's what's happened thus far. The entities in the Dark Aether have been fighting amongst each other since time began, even throughout the entirety of the old Aether storyline, and all the while they were entirely, or at least in large part, unaware that there were any other realms outside of the Dark Aether. One day, however, this would suddenly all change. When Nikolai banished all the dimensions of the Aether to destroy it for good, the entities in the Dark Aether obviously took notice of the colossal amount of strange objects that suddenly appeared in their universe, forcing them to realize that they were not alone. After finding incredible devices like the Pack Punch Machine, some assume that the species outside of the Dark Aether that created it must have been very advanced. When they gazed beyond the dimensional veil and eventually found Earth though, all they found were little more than cavemen. Despite this, some took interest in the new discovery and began to steer the course of human history, however they were never able to cross over physically, only appearing in fire and crystal balls and the like. Eventually, Syraxis and Belicar devised a way to interact in a more direct way through artifacts. They would create items that attempted to appeal to human cultures, and Victor created a Greek short sword as he had long observed them and bound their essence to artifacts. They could then be cast through the veil, and when picked up by a human host, they would bond with the human being able to communicate with the entity and harness their power. Now we also have the Nether Wars. Cortifex's expansionism in the Dark Aether culminated in the Nether Wars, his final push to control the entire realm. This would eventually backfire though, leading to a resistance bigger than he could be thanks to the masterminding of Belakar the Warlock and Verkana the Last, Cortifex was imprisoned within his artifact and trapped in our world, with the connection between it and the Dark Aether being severed, for unknown reasons. This also occurred for the other entities who had created artifacts, Belakar, Syraxis, Nordicus, and Invictor. We can't say for sure when this happened, but given Syraxis was still interfering with Japan up until the Edo period, 1603 to 1867, we know that the connection between our world and the Dark Aether wasn't severed until sometime around there, at the earliest. Now we then have the Occult Society. Meanwhile, a group of wealthy elites in medieval Western Europe would inherit the secret teachings of the many priesthoods across the world who had knowledge of these Dark Aether entities and began using this to commune with the entities themselves, allowing them to learn rune magic, a method of channeling Ethereum for specific purposes that had been used for thousands of years in the Dark Aether. With their newfound power, they would become the Occult Society and eventually compiling the Tome of Rituals as the culmination of all they had learned about the Dark Aether. By the 1920s, however, some disaster occurred within the Order that caused them to go into hiding, splitting the tone pages and placing them throughout the world. Now we also have Die Warheit. Following the onset of World War II, Gabriel Kraft, a German demonologist, was forced into servitude by Die Warheit in fear of the execution of his spouse, Sasha. Wolfram von Liszt believed that Germany's key to victory lay in mythological sources of power and was blackmailing academics like Kraft to help find them. Kraft was able to locate scattered pages from the Tome of Rituals, which which subsequently led him to the dormant Dark Aether artifacts still in our world. When Project End Station punched a hole in the Dark Aether, however, these artifacts woke up. But now we have everybody's favorite map, Duran Fung. Von List, having bonded with Cortifex through his artifact, was now plotting with the ancient entity. He would get Cortifex back to the Dark Aether, and in return, Cortifex would grant Von List an undead army. This operation was to begin in Stalingrad, where Von List would raise the thousands of dead Nazis from their mass graves. Kraft, deciding he could no longer stand idly by, briefly 
closely bonded with Belakar, making a plan with the scholarly demon to stop Cortifex once and for all. He sent out a distress call, which was answered by four special forces operatives who reached the professor just as Von List and Cortifex erected a barrier spell. Kraft lowered the four artifacts to the four soldiers, and they began the fight against Von List. From Stalingrad, the special forces team were able to access various locations where Die Warheights were also operating. This included Merville, where Von List planned to defeat D-Day landings with his undead army, the Hotel Royal, where the Occult Society based their headquarters and where they used to commune with the Dark Eater entities trapped inside their artifacts, an Imperial Japanese outpost on an Okinawan island where Saraxis's artifact was found and where Dai Warheit were performing an archaeological dig. Whilst performing these operations against Von Lis, the Special Forces find a mysterious page of the tome trapped within a void spell and are unable to break past the magic sealing it. Belakar would repeatedly send messages to the Dark Aether until finally, her old ally, Verkana the Last, would answer, making an artifact so she could join us on Earth. Verkana creates a portal to the eastern desert where Dai Warheit had recently blown up the remains of Cortifex's temple. That leads to Terra Maledicta, reaching the Egyptian desert. The special forces find the site mysteriously abandoned, and when overhearing radio communications from Von List, they confirm that all the Diorhite personnel mysteriously vanished after detonating the explosives around them temple. They confirm that all the Diorhite personnel mysteriously vanished after detonating the explosives around the temple. What was notable, however, were the Dark Aether crystals spilling out from within, now slowly consuming the surrounding area. With Verkana's help, the special forces resuscitate the Decimator, an old general of Cortifexes who was punished after a failure by being merged with his own shield and having his name erased. Wanting revenge against his old master, the Living Shield joins us and, with this power, allows us to secure the Tome Page thanks to his bond with Belakar. Kraft is able to see it despite being hundreds of miles away and, with some study, realizes it contains a secret to separating Von List and Cortifex. But now we return to Shinonuma Reborn. We now understand why Dai Warheit were still excavating the area because it also contained the relic created by Cortifex long ago. In order to stop her annoyance, once and for all, Cortifex created a relic that could forcibly separate a human and a Dark Aether entity and sent it through our world. He convinced the humans on the island that their lord, who was bonded with Seraxis, was a demon possessing him, and so they used the mirror to save him. In order to find the mirror, we restore Seraxis' memories, however this also brings back her life prior to her becoming a Sister of Agony. We learned that she was actually a member of the Dark Aether's royal bloodline, just like Cortifex, and in fact was his wife. Originally, it seemed like nothing else was more important to Cortifex than her, however eventually this changed. He became obsessed with an object within the Dark Aether known as the Construct. According to Seraxis, and I quote, If Cortifex and Von List gain control of the Construct, then everything and everyone, living or dead, will end up as their playthings. We then learned that Cortifex had murdered his parents in order to usurp them and become Lord of the Dark Aether himself. The reason Cortifex erased Seraxis' memories and forced her into servitude ties into this, and when Seraxis gave birth to their child, Child, and I tried to hide it, Cartifex flew into a rage, fearful that the child would one day commit parricide as he had. Alongside his punishment to Seraxis, she claims he also visited bottomless cruelty upon the child, but more on that will be talked about later. Eddie's own master plan is still incredibly mysterious, however we know it requires a stable gateway to the Dark Aether as a major piece, and that is called Project Janus. Janus was the Roman god of beginnings, endings, doorways, time, and duality. If the construct, the source of ultimate power, needs two worlds to be able to be used, then perhaps it is a vital part of Project Janus. What is interesting about the construct is its similar similarities to the MPD from the old Aether storyline. What makes this even more interesting is that, for those who may not remember, the Aether Pyramid was built by a small group of Keepers after they began experimenting with the Dark Aether. It's therefore possible that an entity within the Dark Aether informed them about the construct and its overwhelming power, and it inspired them to make a device that was capable of the same power but for the Aether instead. This would theoretically make the construct the true cause of the entire Aether storyline. Some of you may also notice that, if this was the case, we would once again have a Richtofen striving for a source of ultimate power, which is a sort of thematic parallel that Treyarch loved. Now beginning with the return to Egypt, having now acquired the Relic Mirror from the Swamp of Death, Kraft sends his team back to the Egyptian desert for their final confrontation with Dai Warheit. However, while we were trying to claim the mirror, Cortifix and Bon List had been busy preparing for our arrival. Having noted that a large contributor to the success of Kraft's command those 
was the mysterious pack much machine from the Dark Aether, Quarterfex informs Von Lis that there is a spell they can perform in order to seal the pack punch in a limbo between this world and the Dark Aether itself. Quarterfix, however, does not tell Von Lis that upon performing the spell, all of Von Lis's men will be killed in the process. With the spell succeeding, Dark Aether pockets fill the landscape, areas where the Dark Aether bleeds into the real world, and the pack punch is sealed. Though this leaves Von Lis without any backup, interestingly, this is seemingly also the state the Die Machine pack punch machine is placed in, Craft Special Forces arrive back in the Eastern Desert and are immediately met with the overwhelming Ethereum contamination, with crystals now spread throughout the area, even spewing from the bodies of the deceased Die Warheights soldiers. Upon seeing the state that the pack punch is in, with it surrounded by spectral revenants, the entities point out that if the machine can be restored, the mirror should be able to trace back to the source of the spell, Cortifex, and bring him straight to them. Repairing the machine, the special forces activate the mirror and finally separate Cortifex and Von List, with the Deathless' scepter now in front of them. Unbeknownst to Kraft and his allies, Von List's continual string of failures were in fact all part of Cortifex's plan. Every loss, from allowing Kraft to acquire the tone page, to finding the Relic Mirror, to eliminating all of Die Warheit with the spell, and now the spell's link allowing the mirror to find Cortifex, were all intentional, and Von List was simply the man foolish enough to obey Cortifex's orders. Thanks to the Dark Aether Pockets, Cortifex is able to manifest physically in front of the Special Forces team, and thanks them for bringing him to his goal, the Construct. The Deathless then enters a rift to the Dark Aether, but just before doing so, takes one final action to humiliate Von List, teleporting him to face with Professor Kraft. Sniveling in cowardice, Von List begins to assist Kraft with his team, believing he can bargain for his life. When Kraft's team reaches Cortifex, they see him communicating with the Construct, a giant living monolith. He pleads with the Eldritch Object to let him kill the Special Forces team, but it seemingly tells Cortifex no, and that he must abide by a set of rules, giving Kraft's team a fair opportunity to complete the trials. So what is the Construct? Before continuing, it's worth looking into some of the intel in this map to understand exactly what is going on at this moment. From Belakar, we learn that the Construct is possibly the most powerful entity in existence. It has existed seemingly since the beginning of time and is so ancient that the first denizens of the Dark Aether worshipped it, although it didn't seem to care. The construct is neither good nor evil and has intelligence but almost never intervenes. However, on certain occasions, it has granted a small portion of its power to an entity it deems worthy, this creature that becomes known as the Archon. There have been at least four Archons in the trillions of years of existence in the Dark Aether, although possibly more. The first Archon used the power of the construct to eradicate a parasitic species that threatened the Dark Aether. The fourth Archon smashed the moon of the Dark Aether's entity's home planet to pieces, with the chunks being weaponized and still floating above. Cortifex seeks to become the newest Archon. So now we have the Trials being sent back to Earth. The Rift of the Dark Aether was now barred by three great chains, each representing one of the Construct's Trials, the Trial of Sacrifice, the Trial of Mindfulness, and the Trial of Resilience. These Trials exist so that the Construct can judge the worthiness of an individual, but passing the Trials doesn't necessarily mean that said individual will become the next Archon. Archon. According to Seraxis, Cortifex actually passed the trials long ago, but the Construct rejected him at the time, which only spurred his obsession. These trials may be somewhat difficult for us, but would clearly be easy for an Elder God of the Dark Aether, so it's possible that, given the Construct's sense of fair play and rules, that the trials are adjusted to the person undertaking them. Regardless, the Special Forces team proceed and with the help of their Dark Aether partners, are able to successfully complete the trials, reopening the way to the Dark Aether. Before they leave to finally confront Cortifex, Vonlis reveals that Kraft's husband, Sasha, was killed immediately after being taken into custody by Von List, and it was Von List himself who had written the letters to Kraft. Upon hearing this, the professor is filled with rage and executes Von List on the spot. But I needed you to keep working. I... I shot him. Von List is dead. That was ill-advised. We needed his counsel to stop Cortex. No, Nautilus. We do not need Von List. He is more than just like a fool of himself. 
So now confronting the Archon, arriving back under the shadow of the construct looming ahead, the special forces arrive too late and witness Cortifex's ascension. He has now become the next Archon. Hope isn't entirely lost for Kraft's team, however. Thousands of years ago, when Cortifex's armies burned the wilds of the Dark Aether, it was just thought that all life there had been destroyed, but in reality, one life form was just laying dormant. These were the Anemones, and the overwhelming power of the construct had awoken them. While Cortifex was connected to the construct, he was, in effect, immortal. However, through using the Anemones and Dark Aether crystals, the team found an ingenious way of damaging Cortifex. Having allowed one of these Anemones to corrupt the crystal, and then throwing the crystal at one of the floating rock shards that hang above the Dark Aether, it causes it to be pulled into the construct, making Cortifex vulnerable. With great effort, the Special Forces team were able to defeat Cortifex, and as the construct disappears, Nordicus exclaims, let the bottomless depths of the Dark Aether claim his corpse, watching his old lord's body fall lifelessly into the darkest depths of the Dark Aether. With Cortifex defeated, many of the characters are left with uncertain fates. What we do know, though, is that Kraft survives and will possibly be a character relevant to the future of the story. Some have brought up an intel from Black Ops Cold War, where Dr. Strauss alludes to a sacrifice Kraft has to make, and have been confused that we seemingly don't get to see that. However, this is due to a misunderstanding about what Strauss says. Kraft was a demonologist, and his life's work was a study of unexplained phenomena. For the first time in his entire career, he had found tangible proof that demons were more than just stories, and not only that, he himself had an impact on their world. In order to defeat court effects and set the world right, Kraft would have to sacrifice that, the potential of being the world's most renowned scientist, bringing a whole new field of study to light, instead returning to his university where he would live a seemingly unremarkable life. That is a sacrifice Strauss, now a scientist studying Ethereum, would also have to make in order to stop the Forsaken. Now in terms of what the future holds, while many threads are left hanging in a somewhat unsatisfactory place, we can look both to Cold War and beyond to see where they might end up. Firstly, and most importantly though, it's important to discuss Zykov. For a long time, it was uncertain as to how Zykov grew so powerful, we knew he consumed his enemies, and that is still likely true, as Nordicus quotes, let the bottomless depths of the Dark Aether claim his corpse? That can be taken to allude to that, but if we examine what Cortifex is able to do as an Archon, and compare that to Zykov, it seems likely that Zykov too became the next Archon at some point. Both Cortifex and Zykov were able to use the powers of the Dark Aether entities at will. During Cortifex's boss fight, the entities are surprised when this happens, and so we know that this is not a normal thing. Zykov too does this, and so it seems likely he sources his power from the same source. Zykov also sees the future, an ability so powerful that only a source like the Construct that can control reality itself could grant it. The key to understanding the Construct is that it isn't an object like the summoning key or the MPD. Instead, it's one of the most powerful characters in the story, like Monty or the Shadow Man, and it has its own agenda. We can't know for certain, but one theory circulating at the moment is that the Construct has its own master plan, and every Archon is made in order to get closer to this mysterious endgame. During the boss fight against Cortifex, we utilize the floating rock monoliths that are similar in appearance to, but significantly smaller than, the Construct in order to damage Cortifex. It is possible that these are the chunks of the Smash Moon mentioned by Belakar. If that's the case though, then it means that actions of a prior Archon that were seemingly without cause at the time contributed directly to the downfall of a future Archon. This makes it seem as if the Construct has a grand plan that we can sacredly imagine. If we follow the logic along, Cortifex's defeat contributes directly to Zykov's rise. Zykov is not killed, but is captured by Eddie. If Zykov is the Archon, then he is still connected to the Construct, meaning that Eddie now has a direct link to it. Alternatively, if Zykov is no longer the Archon, Sam is now in prime position to become the next one, once again, drawing a direct line to Eddie. On a side note, if we look at the Construct itself, it appears as if it's broken around the edges, much like the other floating monoliths. Given those monoliths are attracted to the Construct, it's a possibility that, at one point, the Construct was actually embedded in the moon of the Dark Aether itself, and by smashing the moon to pieces, Pieces, the fourth Archon freed it, drawing a parallel between the Construct and the MPD in the Aether storyline, as a grantor of ultimate power embedded in the moon. Another major plot thread for the future is Mr. Peaks. As discussed in the last video, Mr. Peaks is potentially the child of Seraxis and Cortifex, and once again appears via a side easter egg in the Archon. Furthermore, Seraxis mentions her child again, though is still unwilling to talk about the horror of whatever occurred. Mr. Peaks is currently inside the Dark Aether with Samantha Maxis, and may even be accompanied by Eddie's son, Samuel. Now, knowing about the role of the Archon, yet another possibility is that Samuel is in line to take his godlike power. A final loose end that will likely fit into the next game is Gabriel Kraft. Now that we know he survives the conflict with Die Warheit, it's possible he plays a more direct role than we initially realized in the events of Black Ops Cold War. It is unlikely that Kraft is alive come the foundation of Requiem, as he is one of the most knowledgeable people on Earth when it comes to Dark Aether 
itself, and so he would have been the first person to be brought into Requiem, right? However, it is possible he contributed in a more indirect way to its foundation, especially given Kraft's notes are contained in Requiem archives. Whatever connection lies there may well be explored in the future. Now, although you may not have enjoyed the Archon as a zombie's experience for one reason or another, we could all admit that the lore established in this map, which of course could have been better through a slideshow cutscene or some more radios, it still does set up a very interesting future for the Dark Aether saga, and I think the Vanguard zombie story acting as a prequel to Black Ops Cold War still helped us get up to speed with characters like the Construct, with our Dark Aether entities, with our field upgrades, knowing the backstory behind them, it still gave us some interesting foundation for what could then be explored even more in the next Black Ops game, without having to waste time introducing us to those characters, Vanguard already did the job for us. But that is about it, this has been DK Dynamite, leave your thoughts down below in the comment section, what are your thoughts on the entire story of Vanguard Zombies from start to finish, Duran Fong to the Archon, how are you feeling about the consequences of the Archon boss fight, the future for these characters, and what all this might mean for Black Ops 2024, really hope you've enjoyed, and peace out everybody.